Everything we do here is about to help people. And sometimes, you know, I think we come to church and we don't realize all the things that go on, all the people that are being touched. And it's just so good to hear that. Um, I, I am excited. This is our final day of fasting and prayer. All right, I'm going to go a little longer because I, we have TFC nights, to, you know, this week. So I'm going to go a little longer. But, I, you know, I just, somebody came up to me, you know, between services and they said, you know, this one felt different. And, and I agree. You know, the, the prayer meetings have been just beautiful. Just the, the you know, the, we, we hear from people some of the things that they've done because they just wanted more of God. Isn't that awesome? They just want more of God. Amen. And, um, and so we want to, we just thank you for that. And we just believe this isn't just something that's going to end, but it literally becomes a culture. And, and really, we kind of move from this and just see God do some incredible things in our church. And uh, one of the things that we're believing for, you know, in, in Acts, the fourth chapter, the apostles prayed that, that God, Jesus, would stretch out his hand and that he would do, you know, he would bring healing power and miracles and signs and wonders. We're believing that for our church. We're believing that for the Rio Grande Valley. And, uh, you know, TFC Nights starts tomorrow, and I really encourage you to come out. It'll be for three nights from uh, 7 o'clock to, you know, we don't usually about 8, 8.30, usually. Um, and and we, just, we just want the Spirit of God to move. You know, and, and let, me just, let me just stop right here. I didn't share this in the first service, but I remember as, as a young man when I started getting into the things of God, and, and I just wanted more of the move of the Holy Spirit. You know, we need the move of the Holy Spirit in our life to counteract all the, the nasty desires that come out of our flesh. And, and I remember going into services and seeing things like that happen. Some of it was different, wasn't used to it, but there was a hunger on the inside, and I just wanted more of God. So we really encourage you to come out for that. I believe it will be a great time and we'll just see God move. Well, so today, um, if I could, uh, you know, give a title to this, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give it to you yet because I want, I want to kind of set it up first. But, uh, you know, anytime we travel, you know, I always think it's funny, you know, when somebody says, hey, you know, I say, yeah, we're traveling. Well, which direction you're going? Hey, there's only one way to go when you live where we're at. You know, we don't want to go south right now, so we got to go north. You know, and San Antonio, Houston. Well, when you're taking the drive, there's these green destination signs. I didn't even realize that, you know, the signs were color-coded. Well, the green ones are destination. They're exits. They're mileage. They're, this is the direction where you want to go. And those are destination can't even say it now, destination signs, all right? And uh, I remember before um, we had Google Maps and Apple Maps. Uh, how many of you remember when they had paper maps? See, this, this is a younger crowd because in the first crowd, everybody, but now it's like a third of you. Some of you don't even know what that's like to travel with paper maps. I mean, Terry and I, you know, it's like we're going to go cross country. And, and they used to have, they had them in a book, but sometimes you get them, they fold out. I mean, it'll like take up your entire cab of your car. I mean, you'd be like, okay, I think we're here. You know, and you're trying to guess where you're at. And sometimes you're going the wrong direction and you don't know it because you don't have Google saying, you know, turn around, turn around. And, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, one of these destina destination things would come up and say, 30 miles to Laredo. We're not going to Laredo. What in the world? And you have to figure out what you did wrong. Well, now we have Google and all those things that tell us the destination. But what I want to talk about today is that we have something in our life that literally has, that, that causes us to have a destination. There's something that we do that defines our destination. That's really important for you to understand. And, 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 and I really want to make this, this point is that sometimes we just think, oh, you know, our destination's already planned. No, you can change it. Let me say it again. You can change your destination in your life. And I'm going to tell you something that you do every th day that defines your destination. Guess what it is? It's your words. 
In fact, if I gave a title to this, it would be Destination Words. We have a destination that we literally take and, and cause to happen because of what comes out of our mouth. And some of us don't realize that. So let's look at some Bible, all right? Did you know that your eternal destination is decided by your words? This is what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Your eternal destination is decided by a prayer of your words. Think about that for a second. The power of your words. And if, still, if you don't think you have power, Proverbs 18, 21 out of the Message Bible says this. Words kill, words give life, they either poison or fruit you choose. All right? Um, in the NIV, it says that the tongue has the power of life and death. In Proverbs 13, 3, it says those who control their tongue will have long life. And those who blab a lot, oh, sorry, open your mouth, <laughs> can ruin everything. All right? Words, what, what I want you to understand today, what I want you to get out of this message is that your words are powerful. John 15, 3, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, um, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Jesus understood the incredible power of his words because they were words that came from God himself that were anointed by the Holy Spirit. And because the disciples received that word, it cleaned them. What does that mean? It transformed them. It changed them. I want you to know that God's word in your mouth will change your life. All right? That, that, that is so important. But, but listen, you know, I, I appreciate the clapping, but it's what we do when we leave these doors. And, and I don't know about you. First of all, I, I'm going to say that Controlling my words has always been a challenge for me. And, and you know, I, I'm a verbal person when it comes. I process verbally, all right? And, and you know, sometimes I, I, I've always didn't realize I was a leader. And so I found out sometimes I could influence people with my words. Sometimes I felt like I wanted things to change, so I would push with my words. I know none of you have ever done any of that. And sometimes I should have just shut my mouth, and I didn't. Come on, somebody. You know, the, I, we won't go there because we're going to go a different direction today and we, I mean, because there's so much we could talk about this. But there's a whole bunch of scriptures, especially in Proverbs, that talks about the more you talk, the more you sin. Now, I, I'm not saying just because you talk, you sin, but sometimes you, you just need to be quiet. You, you need to, you know... Turn that thing off and just say that nothing else needs to be said because anything that's going to come out is not good. And, and, you know, so, but I don't think we realize there's power in our words. And, and that's, that's what I really want to drive home today. You know, there's a saying when I was a kid, and I don't know if you've heard this too, sticks and stones will break my bones. How many? A lot of you guys have never heard this saying. Okay, okay. You're just, you're just. Your arm's tired. All right, sticks, <laughs> sticks and stones will break my bones. Words will never hurt me. That is a lie, okay? Whoever made that up for us kids to say, that is so wrong. Because you can break my bone, they'll put me in a cast, and in a few weeks or months, however long it takes, I don't even know because I've never broken a bone, you'll be fine. And you'll live life, and maybe on a cold day you'll feel. But that, that's it. But listen, all of us in this room are impacted by words that have been spoken over us. For some of us, there's been, there's been godly words that have been spoken over us, and it's impacted our life. For some of us, there's been some hurtful, damaging words, either when we were children, um, 
you know, overly critical or, or just harsh. It could be, you know, in, in times with someone you dearly loved and, and they said things that hurt you so deeply. And to this very day, you are tethered to those words and it affects the way you think. It affects the way you talk. It affects the way you operate. Words are powerful. And that is something we have to understand. And, 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 and if nothing else... <clears throat> I, I believe that out of this message, you'll begin to understand not just to open up the floodgates and do what I call, you know, verbal vomiting. You just let it rip. And you say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I, that's the way I vent. Figure out another way to vent. You know, I, I remember a story. We had this, we, we were, Terry and I, we were first in the ministry, didn't have a lot of money and and uh, we had three kids, they're all real young, and, and, um, and so we had these really dear friends, real dear friends of ours, and she needed a place to stay, they were engaged, and, and they were dear friends, and she's, so they, they, she, you know, we had an extra room the, and a place we were renting, and so they, they, we rented a room out to her. And, and you know, do you know how you end a friendship? Live together. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not talking about marriages, just the other, all right. <laughs> We'll, we'll get into that one in a minute. Don't worry. We're, we're, we're heading there. We're heading there. All right? And, and, and so for about a month, six weeks, everything was great. I mean, I thought this was a great decision. And then one morning she woke up and she unloaded on us. You would have thought we were from Al-Qaeda. I mean, it was crazy. She started unloading, telling us this and that. I mean, criticizing everything we did. It was harsh. And my wife and I are just kind of looking at each other. We can't believe it. You know, this is our dear friend. I mean, she is just unloading. And then she just leaves and slams the door. And I look at my wife, and I'm like, okay, that was over the top, you know. And we were trying to navigate through it. And we're like, she's our dear friend. I'm sure that she's just having a bad day. But stuff she said hurt, you know. And, and even though it was extreme, you know, those words, you know, it's like some of them have a little truth to them, and, and it hurt. And so she comes back the, the, that evening, she comes in the door, and she goes, hi, and she just goes upstairs to her room. And we're like, wait a minute. So I, I go up there, and I said, hey, um, you know, do, do you need to talk? She goes, no, I'm good. And I said, well. Earlier today, you kind of unloaded on us. She goes, no, I'm good now. <laughs> she would never talk about it. Now, she's a wonderful person, but our relationship took a hit. It was never the same. She did not understand that her words had power in the relationship, and she would never deal with them, never talk about them, Somehow in her upbringing, there, there was this place where it was just, let's explode and, and then we're okay. And I kind of understand that because in our family, every two weeks, we just blew up. You know, and, and, and I'm just going to say this because it, 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 sometimes it's just so funny and sad. Is we would blow up at each other and say hurtful things and then we'd make up and then we'd, make, we'd always say this statement. This was a terrible argument, but, you know, it, it, good things are going to come out of it. <sighs> no. Because we did it every two weeks. If good things would have happened, we would have changed. You, you, the problem was we had no control over our mouth. Now, I, I don't have time to get into, you know, controlling your mouth. I, I, I will say this, that it's important to learn control. But what you want to do is you want to, your words need to line up with the word of God. And when they get outside the word of God, you got to cut it off. And, and you got to do what James says. you got to be slow to speak. When your emotions are all riled up and you want to unload on somebody, think about this. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. In fact, Proverbs says this. Let me see. I have it here. Proverbs, where, where is that? Da, 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 da. Uh, I know I have it. There it is. Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of wise of the wise brings healing. 
You know, I like what somebody said. In every situation, you have a bucket. You know, let's just say it this way. Every situation where there's a fire, things are out of control. In one hand, you have water. In the other hand, you have gasoline. You make a decision by your words which one you use. The Bible says a soft answer will turn away anger. See, God wants us to learn control over our mouth. And he wants us to learn to use our mouth for his kingdom, not just our own selfishness. And, and, and again, I don't have time to get into this, but just really fast, you know, it, it, a lot of times our mouth is just connected to our own selfish needs, desires, and emotions, and it spreads. I mean, the Ephesians, I mean, James says it this way. It says it, sp it spreads a hellish fire. Nothing will destroy your family, your life, your destination more than your words. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. Thank you. All right. <laughs> now, let, let, let's, let's change a little bit and, and, and let's talk about two different things that I think with your words that, that help bring your destination. One is that your words breeds desire. Okay, let me, let me give you an example. Year, years ago, um, I, I, we, our church was much, much smaller. This is many, many years ago. And how many people in the house love chocolate? These are my friends right here, right here. My brothers, my sisters. Now, I don't, I don't eat much chocolate anymore. I, I, I just had to adjust my lifestyle. But at one time, I was a bona fide chocolate-holic, okay? And, and um, I had my favorite candy bar. Anybody ever heard of a symphony? Yeah, the, again, these are good chocolate people, all right? And, and uh, it's not necessarily the most popular bar. And I remember one Sunday morning I was talking about it, and I talked about the symphony, and hardly anybody knew about it. So I started describing the candy bar to them, all right? And I didn't think anything about it, except that after the service is over, I, was, I created a desire for a symphony bar because I'm talking about it. And I was like, I want one. So I go to Walmart, and I go over, and, and they're all gone. Now, they don't usually carry a ton of them, but... It's like, they're all gone. And I'm like, what in the world happened here? I've never gone to Walmart and couldn't buy a symphony bar. So I said, well, there's a Target not too far away. So I go over to the Target, and I go, and I go to pick up a symphony bar. There's no Target. And I'm kind of starting to shake a little bit because, you know, I'm a chocoholic, and I'm thinking, who took all the symphony bars? Well, I found out the next Sunday it was the TFC people, the people from church. They would come to me one by one. Hey, we tried that bar. That was incredible. I said, you're the guys who took all my chocolate. <laughs> now, now, I want you to get a picture of this. I don't talk about that candy. There's plenty of bars for me to get. But, but listen to me. The words created desire. Are you with me? Now, now, this is really good because what you talk about all the times, what you're going to desire. If you talk about fishing all the time, that's what you're going to desire. Look at it this way. What you talk positively about or you praise builds desire. Does that make sense? What you criticize takes and takes away desire. And what you don't talk about at all just causes a dormant desire. So if you look at your life, you can tell what you like by what you talk about. And see, in a lot of us, we don't talk about God in our homes. We don't talk about God. We wait till Sunday. You know, we don't talk about God with our kids. We expect the church to do it. Come on, somebody. Listen, it is not our job to raise your children. You had them. I didn't. You know, I, I've gotten people who've gotten mad at us and said, you know what? Something's wrong with your church. Look at my kid. I'm like, I didn't raise them. You did. I, had, I get them for an hour. The rest of the time, they're with you. 
It's your job. The Bible is very explicit that we're supposed to take and talk about God with our children. How do you build a hunger? Now, now listen, I, I see this all the time, and I, I don't know why I'm going here because I didn't go here with the first service, but I feel like I'm supposed to here in the second service. But I, I see it all the time. It's like it's not talked about in the home. There's no desire from the kids, and they wonder why their kids went astray. Well, how often did you guys talk about the goodness of God? Or all did you do is talk about the pastor and, you know, and he, I can't believe he did this and the church did that and the church, and you wonder why your kid has a critical attitude towards God because you, all you do is talk about the negative because the, the bottom line is we're being selfish. Amen, pastor. That's so good. Thank you. Now, listen. Now, now we're going to get in the nitty gritty. It's the same way in your marriage. There, there's, a, there's a scripture in, in Songs of Solomon. I mean, if you want to w- read some R-rated stuff, go to Songs of Solomon. <laughs> and and it, this is what it says in, in chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved. It's talking about a, a married couple. And his desire is for me. I, I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you really desired your spouse? And I don't, don't, don't think about this physically. I mean, just like I desire to be around them. You know, I remember when Terry and I were going with each other, you know, and uh, we, we had seen, we saw, saw each other, I mean, a lot. And, I, and we both said, you know, let's calm it down a little bit. Let's just take about three days and, sep- and be apart. The first night, my wife calls me about 6 o'clock. She goes, I'm tired of this already. I said, okay, I'll be right over. I mean, I, that's... That was it. I mean, then I thought about, you know, we, we go, sometimes she'll travel somewhere, and we don't talk to each other for days. You know, one time I left the house, I forgot to tell her I was leaving, and, and I was gone for a few hours, she, and, and, uh, and, and then, I, you know, she calls me, and she goes, where are you? And I said, I, I left like three hours ago. She goes, I had no clue. Some shifts when you live together, and some of it's okay, but, but it gets to the place sometimes where all of a sudden, instead of being a magnet that attracts, we push away, and we have the opposite of desire, and we're almost repelled by each other. Come on. And there's a lot of marriages that are going through that. And, and, and now, in the day, back many years ago, don't, don't ask me to do this because I don't do it anymore. I, I, you guys would kill me. But I used to do marriage counseling. About twice a week, I would do nothing but marriage counseling. And um, I married this one couple, and they, they did not like each other. You could tell. They walked in, and, and they treated each other like, you know, they had just married Satan or somebody who drowns puppies. And they were just like, I mean, it, it was bad. And, you know, I had a couch, and there was three seats on it, and they sat as far away from each other as they possibly could. They literally physically kind of turned away from each other. They had their arms crossed. I mean, it was so obvious. There was zero attraction. Those two did not want to be together anymore. So they, but they came to counseling, wanted to try to somehow save their marriage. We started talking. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's like no matter what I said, it went negative. Yeah, but you don't know what that person does. You know what they do. I, I couldn't go get anywhere. I was almost in the place where you guys get out of here. I'm tired of dealing with you. I mean, that's how I felt. And, and I said, okay, I, I, God, give me some wisdom here. So I said, okay, I gave him a piece of paper, pencil. You guys remember what that is? Piece of paper, <laughs> pencil. Anyway, and, and I said, listen, here's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to write ten things that you like about the other person. One person went, oh, excuse me? I mean, you could tell that offended him. And, and I looked at him and I said, listen, you know what? I, I didn't invite you in here. You're the one that wanted to come in here and help, get help. So if you want help, then you do what I ask you to do. And they said, all right, all right. And, and for, I mean, they just sat there for a few minutes and did nothing because they couldn't think of anything. You know why? It had been so long, come on, listen to me, that they had said anything positive about one another. They had spent so much time 
going over and over how the other person did things they didn't like. They forgot, come on somebody, that there was some blessings that they married. And some of you are sitting by somebody and you have forgotten why you married that person. You, you don't think there's anything godly in them, but there is. And they started writing it down. And it took them a while. They, and they, they wrote the first one. Then you could tell there was a pause. And they wrote the second one. And then all of a sudden, around the third or fourth one, they started writing faster. Their countenance, listen to me, started to change. I watched them smile. I watched them kind of lighten up. And they started writing faster. One of them, I think it was the guy, wrote 13. He couldn't stop at 10. And then I said, now here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to read this to each other. They got so lovey-dovey, I thought I was going to have to leave the room. <laughs> like, guys, calm it down. Calm down, right? You go home. <laughs> now, wait a minute. What just happened here? Did, did they change? Did, did the person that they were in that room with all of a sudden were transformed into somebody else? No. Their perspective changed. Because what you praise, you will have a desire for. You will want to go there. It will be your destination. What you criticize, listen to me, you don't want to go there. You want to reject it. And, and I found something so beautiful even in my own marriage. Listen, my wife and I have been married for a long time. We're both A-type personalities. We, we are strong people. You know, I had one person who looked at our personalities, on the, and we did a personality profile, and when they talked about the A-type personality, I was a 99, she was a 98. And, and, and the personality profile person said, are you guys okay? I said, why? She said, is there like war in your home? Because two people with that strong of an A-type personality shouldn't get married. And I said, well, you should have told me that like 20 years ago. But we get along great. But you know what we've learned? Listen, we're strong. And there's things to this day we do not agree with. But you know what? God bless me with her. And there's things I don't like about her, and there's things she doesn't like about me. Let me, let me just get something out of your head. There is no person on the planet that's compatible with you. Okay, it, it, it doesn't exist. So you're like, I need one that's compatible. You're, you're just going to get a repeat. It'll be different, but the same. It'll just be different problems. You're like, you'll cor overcorrect in one area, and it's going to cause another. Listen, th none of us are com compatible without Jesus. Amen. Jesus is what makes us compatible. <laughs> My wife and I would have killed each other without Jesus. One of us would have been in prison. <laughs> I'm going to give it that she probably would have been the one because I, she's stronger than I am. I mean, she, I, that's what I mean. I'd be the one that lose. Anyway, and, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is this, is that I, 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 when I get frustrated with my wife, I make a choice to praise her. I, I want to find things that are good because there are great things about her. There's incredible things. Yeah, are there things that frustrate me? You better believe it. That doesn't ever change. But what changes is I realize that's not what makes my marriage. What makes my marriage is that she has great things. I have great things. And when we focus on those things and listen, and we put them together, now we have something very powerful for God. Does that make sense? And you will change your attitude about your marriage strictly by what you desire. What you speak about, you talk about, that's what you'll desire. And you'll begin to forget about the stuff you don't agree with. Now, I doesn't mean, let me just say this and I'll move on. That doesn't mean that you, 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 know, you can't talk about things that you disagree. I don't, I'm not saying that. There's things you need to work through. But there are times you just can't, it's just like you can't get through it. Move on, put, give it to Jesus. And focus on what you can agree on. Does that make sense? And there's some things you'll just never agree on. All right? When it comes to politics, my wife, we don't, we don't agree. All right? So that's just the way it is. 
Um, now, I, I, there's a lot more I could say about marriage. Uh, I think in April, I'm probably going to do a marriage series. I'm pretty excited about it. I've already been working on it. Amen. But um, I, I want to move on to your kids. Now, we won't take as long with the kids, but I just have one thing I want to mention about kids. I, I think in the day, when, you, when we talked about raising kids, what it all came down to is, we, listen, every one of us want our kids to take and do well. And, and this isn't about wrong motive. It's a wrong approach. Sometimes the only time that we talk to our kids and really talk about their behavior is when they do something wrong. It's like when they're doing everything right, we just, oh, everything's good. And we just let it go. But we, and, and, and so what happens, we just correct or talk about their behavior when they do something wrong. Now, you should correct their wrong behavior. I'm not saying you shouldn't. You should not let that go. But that should not be the only time that you talk about their behavior. Because if all you ever talk about their behavior is when they do something wrong, you will cause insecurity, you will cause fear, you will cause a kid that's based on works. See, what I have found is that I want to talk about their behavior when they do things well. Now, let me give you an example, and this will be pretty much it with the kid thing. I, I love, like, when I have my grandkids in the car and we're driving somewhere, I love to talk about the Word with them. And we don't talk about deep theological stuff. My goodness, they're too young. And most people don't care about that stuff anywhere. And, and we just talk about, you know, simple things. And so one day, we, we're driving to school, I think, and, and I said, hey, Guys, what about the love of God? And they start talking about how much Jesus loved them and all this. And, and I said, what's one of the ways that you can take and, and, and t love somebody? And one of them said, you can give. I said, you guys. So here's what I did. I'm creating desire. I'm creating a destination. I said, you guys are great givers. I'm watching out of the rearview mirror. And listen, they have candy that mom had given them, that they're supposed to eat later on. They had gotten out because grandpa's in the car. <laughs> and I watch. Now, you see a kid with candy, it's mine. Yeah. I watch one of them starts doling out candy to their brother and sister. So what do I do? I don't just smile. I go, I am so proud of you. And I named their name. I'm so proud of you. They lit up like a Christmas tree. And now the other two are like, well, I'm going to give too. And they started giving more. These kids are like unloading their candy on each other because they're trying to outgive the other person. And I'm sitting there watching this going, man, this is awesome. What am I doing? I'm creating desire. Now, what does that do? Instead of correction's good, and if you do do correction, try to end up on a positive note. But when you, when you speak words, of encouragement and praise to those kids for the proper behavior. They light up like a Christmas tree. It builds positive behavior stronger than correcting a child. Does that make sense? All right. Now, don't praise them for something they didn't do. That will just confuse them. All right. It's like, they're just so awesome and they're over there tearing up, you know, the couch. I mean, don't, that's not what we're talking about. Don't do it falsely. But when they do something, and especially tie it to the word of God and praise them for it, and they'll want to do it. All right? So here's the last one. All right? I want to talk about that your words releases the power of God. Thank you, Nikki, for that. That was great. The rest of you are silent. All right. Come on now. Let's get. I, I, I want to stir you up about the power of God. Because. We need the power of God. We need to start talking about it. We need to start believing it. We need to start taking a stand for it. God wants to move in your families. He wants to move in your bodies. He wants to take and, and, and move in your finances. He wants to move in your heart, in your mind, in your emotions. He wants to take and have ministry go through you. Amen. That, see, but you gotta, you got to start standing up. And start believing for the power to move when it gets challenged. And, and part of the problem that we have is that we've been taught by religion that, well, God just, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. 
can I, I want you to hear this. God has given you a mouth with the power of God when you speak in faith the word of God that will release his power. And that power will transform and change. And if you stay silent, it won't. Well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. No. He gave you the power. He gave you faith. You've got to use it. And how do you use it? With your mouth. All right? Now, I, I want to use an example that we all know about probably, and it's David and Goliath. Because there's a lot of us in this room, we've got giants that we're facing. And those giants look bigger than anything that we can handle. We, we, we have no way to slay them. And, and, but those giants talk to us. They intimidate. And when you feel that intimidation, you have to make a decision. When, when the world, when a bill comes and it starts screaming and says, you know what? You're, you, you can't pay me. You don't have enough money. You're going to have shortage. We can start speaking to it. When, when you get a report from the doctor and it says that, you know, you're not going to have a healthy life, you can declare in the name of Jesus, we're going to go to the other side and we're going to be whole in Jesus' name. But see, it's not always easy. And, and, I, and I thought about that in 1 Samuel 17. Verse 43, this is what Goliath said to David. He said to David, David comes out to meet him, and David has a slingshot, which is basically, you got to understand, that's a stick, all right, with some stuff on it that he can sling rocks, all right, and, and, or something like that. And anyway, and Goliath said to him, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Is that, is that what you're going to defeat me with, is sticks? And the Philistine cursed David. I mean, this guy is several feet taller than David. You know, and, and, and he cursed him. And he says, come here like he's a little kid. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Right then, David had to feel the crush, the burden, that the, impre the incredible oppressiveness of the evilness of this man. And the destruction he wanted to do to David. And David looks at him and he's got giant muscles and giant armor. He's got a sword and a spear. This guy's beating everybody. And David, at that moment, could have let what he saw, come on, dictate his words. And he could have thrown up, but he still wants to be spiritual. And he could have thrown up a little mamby-pamby prayer. Oh, God, somehow, some way, if you could, if it's your will, just a bunch of ifs, kill this guy. And we would have never heard about David. Because in a few days, they'd be doing David's funeral. Come on. His words would have dictated his destination. You can change your destination. And some preacher who's real religious, because I've, I've been at some of these funerals, would have done David's funeral and said, you know, you know, it was just, it was just David's time. It wasn't David's time. It was David's words that changed his destination. And the preacher could have gotten real, because I've been to him. I remember my aunt died, and she died in her 40s. And she loved God, but cancer got her. And, and she didn't know. We tried to help her, but anyway. And she left kids, and she left her husband. And I remember this preacher, you know, I, 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 he was trying his best. But it made me mad because he goes, you know, it was just her time. And, and God just needed another flower for his garden. That's what he said. I'll never forget it. I'm thinking, what? She's not a flower? Where, where in the world in the Bible do you find that? First doubt, second, two, I mean, come on. I mean, th 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 there's nowhere in Scripture that says they just made that up. 
some emotional garbage. No, the Bible says that this enemy, the devil himself, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Is she in heaven? Yes. Did she got, did she, was she stolen from her family? Yes. Nothing bad about it. It's just it could have been different if she would have known how to speak. Come on. To her giant. And, and listen, I mean, let's look, at, let's look at Bible here. This is what, what David said. When he felt all that fear, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. And can I tell you something? He didn't say, you know, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. Uh, somehow I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord. There was no whining. Come on. He spoke with boldness. He declared his destination. He says, you come to me in the natural, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. I love that. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, this day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistines' army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those who are gathered here will know that this, this it is not by the sword or the spear. In other words, not by natural things that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into his, into our hands. That stone had no choice. I, I believe this all in my heart, and i got to quit. The giant could have been there, and I think David could have thrown the rock that way, and it would have gone that way. Because it didn't go through his skull because David was all that. Because his words decreed it. I'm going to ask you a question. What needs to be changed in your life? Do you know you can talk yourself happy every day of your life? Start speaking the blessings of God. Start speaking faith. Start speaking my family is going to serve God. God, I'm an overcomer in every situation. The greater one lives on the inside. I'm more than a conqueror in you. Just start speaking to yourself. It will make you happy. Why? Because your words decide your destination. Will you stand to your feet? Let me pray with you right now. Father, I pray for every person in the room. I pray for the revelation of this message today. The importance of our mouth. That, Father, our mouth speaks your word. There's people in this room that are facing giants. And, Father, I just come in agreement with them right now. And I speak over them freedom, healing, miracles, deliverance. I believe for marriages to be healed. I thank you for kids to come back to God. I thank you for your power to flow and to move. Stretch out your hand, Father. Do heal people. Do miracles, signs and wonders. We decree it, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for change and transformation. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm right with God. I don't know that if I died right now that I'd go to heaven. Listen, Matthew 12 says that with your mouth today, you can change your destination, your eternal destination.